And this is an introduction to skeletal muscle and skeletal muscle tissue. We're going to examine what a cell in a muscle does. Skeletal muscle tissue or skeletal mus muscle is actually very long and it has striations. Dark light, dark light, dark light. And skeletal muscles do attach to the skeleton because that's how the skeleton is able to move through the contractions of the skeletal muscles, which are made up of many muscle cells. The striations are the light and dark banding pattern. Uh, skeletal muscles are voluntary, meaning that they are under a conscious control and they are responsible for body motility and they can exert forces from the very small to the very large. So a fraction of an ounce to over 70 pounds. So the function of skeletal muscles, and I do need to add that smooth muscles and cardiac muscles will be covered in AMP2. So for AMP1, we're just gonna zero in on skeletal muscle function and this particular lecture is going to be going into the skeletal muscle cell itself and then afterwards the PowerPoint 2 and 3 will be on whole muscle. So this is about skeletal muscle cell physiology and function and structure. Um, and a skeletal muscle cell is called a muscle fiber. All right, so skeletal muscles are responsible for locomotion. They can also maintain posture, stabilize joints, and when you shiver, generate heat. It can also store glycogen. And that's important because glycogen is a polymer of glucose. So if your blood glucose levels drop, then you can remove some of that store glycogen and depolymerize it into glucose and get the blood sugar level back to normal. So this is showing you a muscle. Uh, muscles are, do have protective connective tissue. Um, the epimysium is the connective tissue around the whole muscle. Um, you have bundles of muscle cells and these bus bundles of muscle cells are protected by a connective tissue perimysium. And the individual muscle cells, these little red blobs, are also have a connective tissue um, surrounding them called the endomysium. And all of that is for protection. Um, if you pull out one of the muscle cells, so this is the muscle bundle, which is called the fascicle. And if you then pull out an individual muscle cell from the bundle or the fascicle, it's called a muscle cell or muscle fiber. So I'm going to be talking about muscle fibers, understand that that is the way we talk about muscle cells. All right, next slide. Okay, each muscle cell obviously has a nerve and a blood supply. And blood supply is going to give it nutrients, get rid of the waste products, and nerves are going to instruct the muscle cell to contract. Um, the muscle fiber or cell is going to be innervated by a motor neuron, and that is going to always release the same neurotransmitter of acetylcholine. Uh, muscle cells need to be stimulated by acetylcholine in order to contract. So if the muscle neuron is damaged, like in a spinal cord injury, the muscle cell cannot contract, even though the muscle cell itself, or the muscle itself and the cells within the muscle are intact. Why? Because they have to be told to contract by a motor neuron releasing acetylcholine. That doesn't happen if that is disrupted by a spinal cord injury. The muscle cannot contract. All right, so we're going to look at up close and personal the microscopic anatomy of a skeletal muscle cell. 
The thing about skeletal muscle cells is that they are very long. And the way they get long is during embryonic development, they're going to fuse a lot of individual cells to make a very, very long cell. And that is going, so every skeletal muscle fiber or cell is produced by fusion of embryonic cells, which allow the final multinucleated cell to be quite long. But if you have multiple nuclei, it's impossible to coordinate mitosis. There's just way too many nuclei in that muscle cell. So if you lose muscle cell due to injury, it's permanent. You've lost it, it's gone, it cannot be replaced. The cells that remain can bulk up and change their diameter, but you've forever lost the muscle cell. So here is one glorious muscle cell. And you can see the striations, the dark light, dark light, dark light. We'll talk about the contractile proteins in a second that make up the dark and the light striated patterns. This is showing that it's multinucleated. Here's a nucleus here, here's a nucleus there. Uh, the outer membrane, the plasma membrane, has a special name. And the cell or plasma membrane is called the sacoloma. Um, there are mitochondria scattered throughout to get energy for muscle contraction, but look at the bulk of this muscle cell. The bulk of this muscle cell is, hold on, let me get back to this. There we go. Uh, it's made up of these bundles of muscle fibers, and the muscle fibers in a muscle cell are called myofibers. It's it's confusing, I, I, I absolutely. So a muscle cell or a muscle fiber is composed of many muscle fibrils, which are made up of dark and light banding contractile proteins, which we will talk about very soon. In fact, we'll start to talk about it now. Um, scientists like to reduce everything to its smallest part or smallest unit. So the smallest unit of muscle contraction is called the sacomere. Here we go, sacomere. Um, it is the region of the muscle fiber between what are called two Z discs. The sacomere is made up of two contractile proteins, thick myosin and thin actin. And we'll show you how they interact to cause muscle contraction or muscle shortening in a second. All right, so here's a sacomere. And the sacomere is defined to be that distance between two Z lines. So here's a Z line or a Z disc, uh, also called a Z line. And so you have a Z line here in blue and a Z line here in blue. And between the two Z lines is a sacomere the smallest unit of muscle contraction. Here is where it gets confusing. There are only two contractile proteins, actin and myosin. And yet, muscles were first studied using a microscope long before they knew about biochemistry and contractile proteins. And you're stuck with an old term terminology that were defined by histo histologists, even though our new understanding of biochemistry reduces the set to just two contractile proteins. And you need to know both, but it's an open book quiz. So here goes the nonsense. If I was a histologist and back in the 1900s and I looked at this muscle cell, I would see dark and light banding patterns and I would then label each and every um, line, area, zone that I possibly could. And a lot of it is a trick of the light and how you put down the proteins. They'll look one way if they're horizontal, they'll look another way when they're vertical and histologists have named everything. 
So the Z line is called the Z line because you have proteins that are laid down in a vertical fashion that reflected light and they called it a Z line or a Z disc. And then you have an area to the right and left of the Z line which appeared pretty light and that's called the I band. And then you have an area where the, it seems to be pretty dark like from here to here and this dark area is called the A-band. So the dark light, the light is the I-band, the dark is the A-band. Well, son of a gun, they found little subdivisions of the A-band. This dark area right here is called the H-zone. You are, I'm sorry, it's called the, uh, this darkish area is called the H-zone. This is actually just um, composed of the heavy myosin and then the M line is in the middle of the sarcomere the middle middle because here we go Z to Z and here's the M line and that is an additional um, minor 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 protein but however it looked much darker so you gave it a name so we have the Z disc to Z disc for the sarcomere you have the I band, which is the light, A band, which is the dark, H zone, which is the darkest, and then the M line to define the middle. Okay, so what is it actually made up of? Sacomere. Uh, the thin filaments are the A band, thick filaments are the, I'm sorry. Thick filaments are the A-band, thin filaments are the I-band. The Z-disc anchor, they're, they're basically anchor, po anchor points so that you're not going to have everybody sliding around. They're going to be anchored to something. Um, the thin filaments are your actin and your thick filaments are your myosin. Um, when everybody is relaxed, the thin filaments do not overlap with a thick um, and obviously they're going to overlap when they contract hold on that's going to be in another few slides and then the M line or the middle and then that has to do with the fact that you're going to slide towards the middle and shorten that little muscle cell okay so this is showing you you have all this terminology thanks to the histologist and the biochemist would say, hey, look, you have a heavy myosin and you have thin actin and they're going to interact and they cause the muscle shortening. And that's all there is to it. So let's get to just how they work to shorten or contract the muscle cell. Okay, so myosin is the thick filament. Myosin is the heavy band. And it has a rod-like tail, and at the end of the tail, there are two heads. Um, the heads, okay, the tail is just this long protein tail, I'll show you it in a second. And then the heads are going to form, be able to form cross bridges and attach to actin. So here's a pretty picture. Here is one myosin. There's its tail. And here are the two heads. Now I'll show you how those heads can attach to actin in a sec. Um, here are many, many, many myosin molecules with many, many tails and many, many heads. And that's why it's called the dark when you're looking at the striations because it's so big. Oh, thin filaments. Um, actin, you have two actin filaments. They wind around each other. Uh, to form what we call the contractile actin protein, a muscle contraction. Um, the actin are going to have sites on which myosin heads can bind during contraction. They also have regulatory proteins associated with it, and they are going to control the interaction of actin and myosin. And they have the names of tropomyosin and troponin. So here's a pretty picture. So here are your two blue actin filaments wound around each other. 
And here are your two regulatory proteins. The very, very long, 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 long fiber is called tropomyosin. And then these little yellow uh, are the troponin. And I always think of them or remember them because tropomyosin is the longer of the two names. So it's the long fiber and troponin is the shorter of the two names. And you just have these complexes scattered along the long tropomyosin fiber. And I'll show you how they regulate in a sec. All right, so a muscle cell are going to have banks and banks and banks of these myosin and actin filaments. And right now they're relaxed, meaning that there's no interaction between the myosin and the actin, no binding. So this is a relaxed, lengthened muscle cell. And this is a cross-section of a sarcomere. All right. How they interact is called the sliding filament model of muscle cell contraction, specifically skeletal muscle cell contraction. It says thin filaments slide past the thick ones so the actin and myosin filaments overlap and shorten the muscle cell. In a relaxed state, thin and thick filaments overlap only slightly. Upon stimulation, myosin heads bind to actin and perform a power stroke, which move the actin filaments towards the M line. And this happens simultaneously. It's like a muscle cell is stimulated and all the sarcomeres are going to have myosin bind to actin, do the power stroke, and move those filaments of actin towards the middle. And as they slide towards the middle, they are going to shorten the muscle cell. And it's, it's all or none. Either all of them do it or none of them do it. And for contraction, we're going to have all of them do it. Even though I'm just going to be talking about one little sarcomere, because as one goes, all of them go, all or none. Um, so when uh, the myosin forms these cross bridges, when their heads bind to the actin, and move the filaments towards the M line as they do these power strokes. That contraction or shortening of the muscle cell begins until it is maximally shortened or maximally contracted. Okay, so how do we regulate this? And we regulate this by regulating calcium and obviously regulating stimulation by motor neuron firing, but we're going to do the calcium bit first. Um, calcium is stored in a sac called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. So it's an elaborate endoplasmic reticulum. It surrounds each one of these sarcomeres muscle fibers, and it regulates the flow of calcium. And what we're going to discover is that if calcium is present in the sarcomere, it can bind to troponin, which then can instruct tropomyosin to move off of and reveal the binding sites on actin. So myosin and actin can form cross bridges, and myosin can do its power strokes and move that actin to the M line, and you get contraction. Then when the muscle relaxes, you have the ability to pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which then bereft of calcium, troponin tells tropomyosin to move and cover the binding sites on actin. So myosin can no longer bind. And the actin then relaxes and moves back to its resting position and the muscle cell lengthens, and the lengthening of the cell relaxes it, or a relaxed muscle cell is the length of muscle cell. So um, sarcoplasmic reticulum is either storing calcium or releasing calcium. It's either if it's storing it, the muscle cells relax, and if it's releasing it, the muscle cell can, can contract. So the SR is, like an, is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, it surrounds the myofiber, uh, it 
regulates the flow of calcium. Um, it is connected to the outside, the muscle plasma membrane, aka sarcolemma, by what are called T tubules. So the T is going to be the top of the T will connect with the outside and the bottom of the T connects to the inside sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when you get stimulation, you can get the stimulation down into the cell itself. So the T tubules penetrate the cell's interior, connects with the SR, signals from the plasma membrane, can travel down the T tubule to the SR, changing its function during contraction and relaxation. When the T tubules are stimulated, which we'll do in a sec, the SR releases calcium to the sarcomere, and then it'll bind to troponin, which will move topomyosin off the binding sites on actin. So myosin can form cross bridges with actin, perform power strokes, and move those actin filaments to the M line and shorten the muscle cell. When relaxed, there's a pump in the SR that's going to pump the calcium back into the SR for storage, and that is going to relax the muscle because troponin bereft of calcium will instruct tropomyosin to move down and cover those binding sites on actin. Myosin and actin can no longer interact. Actin slides back and the cell lengthens and relaxes. So this is showing you, uh, it's almost like spider web of sarcoplasmic reticulum in blue. And it either can pump the calcium back into the SR for storage or a um, stimulation uh, of the plasma membrane can travel down the T tubules and then the sarcoplasmic reticulum will respond by releasing the calcium so you can get contraction of the sarcomere. Okay, so this is showing you the T tubule. It's, it's connected to the plasma membrane or sarcolemma. And then if it's if the membrane is stimulated, then the stimulation will travel down the T tubule to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, release the calcium so that your actinomyosin can interact and contract. All right, so here we have stimulation. In order to contract a skeletal muscle, and we're now talking about muscle cells within the muscle, must be stimulated by a motor neuron, and the motor neuron ending is going to release acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, that's going to bind to receptors on the muscle cell membrane, which in turn propagates an electric current. Now, that current is going to flow along the sarcolemma to the T tubules into the interior of the cell, stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, which then binds to troponin which moves tropomyosin off the actin binding sites, which allows myosin and actin to interact and slide, shortening that muscle cell, causing muscle contraction. So this is showing you the beginning where the motor neuron fires its acetylcholine, and the acetylcholine then binds to receptors, these little purple guys, and that will start the excitation of the muscle cell membrane. It goes down the T tubules through the sarcoplasmic reticulum, releases the calcium, which then allows myosin and actin to interact and shorten and contract the muscle cell. Okay, so... This is the artist's attempt to show you both contraction and relaxation. So we're gonna kind of start at the beginning. Motor neuron fires acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to receptors. Starts a wave of electrical excitement down the plasma membrane, down the T tubule, to the cycloplasmic reticulum, releases calcium, 
So it can bind to troponin, which moves tropomyosin off the binding sites on actin, so the myosin head can interact, do a power stroke, slide those actin filaments to the M line, and ta-da! Muscle shortens, muscle contracts. Or muscle cell shortens, muscle cell contracts. Now, that's a one once around. Um, because when the electrical signal comes back to the motor neuron, an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, which will be on the next slide, will destroy acetylcholine. And once acetylcholine is destroyed, no more stimulation. So the pump in the SR is going to then pump the calcium back for storage. And without calcium binding to troponin, troponin instructs tropomyosin to cover the binding sites. And that means actin and myosin cannot interact. Actin goes back to its original long lengthened position and the muscle cell relaxes. Okay, so this is muscle relaxation. Acetylcholine bound to receptors is destroyed by acetylcholinesterase. But not before you start that electrical stimulation. But that means the electrical stimulation goes around once, not twice, because when it gets back to the beginning, acetylcholine has now been destroyed by acetylcholinesterase. So a muscle cell, now this is on the time scale of milliseconds. So at times when we're, you know, making a muscle or trying to lift something that's heavy, it seems that the contraction is continuous. But in reality, it's not. But we perceive things in seconds and minutes and hours. We don't perceive milliseconds. We have instruments that can perceive milliseconds, but we don't perceive it. So we perceive that we're able to pick up that load and go, I don't know, down a flight of stairs and put it down and it seems continuous, but it's not. Um, you have this millisecond of um, the muscle relaxing, but then another wave of acetylcholine comes and then the muscle contraction. So the muscle contraction is actually a little longer than muscle relaxation because that motor neuron fires, relaxes, fires, relaxes, fires, relaxes, fires. And our perception is that the muscle stays contracted. Um, but in actuality, in millisecond steps, you get the contraction, acetylcholinesterase, stops it, muscle cell relaxes, another wave of acetylcholine when the muscle neuron, which is also on millisecond time, makes and releases more acetylcholine, and so it goes. So the cholinesterase is what makes it go around once and only once, and then the motor neuron has to fire again. So the destruction of acetylcholine prevents continued muscle fiber contraction in the absence of additional stimuli. And acetylcholine binding begins the propagation of an of a now action potential that's next week. I'm just gonna say electrical stimulation along the membrane of the entire muscle cell or fiber. Once the stimulation ends, calcium is actively removed into the sarcoplasm reticulum, tropomyosin blockage is restored, and the muscle fiber lengthens and relaxes. And that's it. So the next time I see, no, I see you listen to me is going to be about how does a whole muscle act? How do you control whole muscle contraction and relaxation? So see you then.